Which of these stories will you be talking about tomorrow? Occupy Day 49, and there is now a second Iraq War veteran who's been critically injured in Oakland. This time not from the projectiles, but from police batons. Kayvon Sebegi lays in intensive care after what he says was an unprovoked beating by police. We'll talk to the reporter who broke the story. Mitt Romney's best week ever? New poll numbers show a near tie with the president in 12 swing states. The problem is that as details continue to drip out in the Herman Cain harassment scandal, his numbers continue to soar. Cain must have a secret weapon. I am the Koch brothers' brother from another mother. And Sputnik in a box. We are proud today to, to prove that uh, human can uh, go to Mars. Six astronauts emerge from a simulated trip to Mars, 520 days locked in a room with no sunlight and lots of electronics. Wait, is that Mars or just another weekend for the average teenager? All that and more now on Countdown. I'm a Martian! Good evening from New York. This is Friday, November the 4th, 368 days until the 2012 presidential election. I'm David Schuster sitting in for Keith Olbermann. We start with breaking news tonight from Occupy Oakland. A second U.S. veteran has been injured in a clash with Oakland police. According to the British newspaper The Guardian and Iraq Veterans Against the War, Kayvon Sebegi suffered a lacerated spleen in a police beating Wednesday, and he's in intensive care awaiting surgery. The fifth story in the countdown, Wednesday's violence between police, Occupy protesters, and a small group of black-clad black -clad rioters who smashed windows and lit fires has claimed another victim, along with five protesters and several police officers already reported hurt. The violence broke out after a disused building near the protesters' camp at Frank Ogawa Plaza was occupied and a barrier near the building set on fire. Police responded with tear gas, flashbang grenades, and non-lethal rounds. Some protesters fought back with rocks and bottles. Oakland police made more than 100 arrests. Iraq and Afghan war veteran Kayvon Sebegi told The Guardian he was walking away from the fighting when he ran into the Oakland PD. They lined up in front of me. I was talking to one of them saying, why are you doing this? When one moved forward and hit me in the arms and legs and back with his baton. Then three or four cops tackled me and arrested me. Sebegi says he then spent three hours handcuffed in a police van before he was driven to jail. By that point, the veteran says he was in, quote, unbelievable pain. My stomach was really hurting. It got worse to the point where I couldn't stand up. I was on my hands and knees and crawled over to the cell door to call for help. A nurse was brought to his cell and offered Sebegi a suppository, which... He rejected. Police then let Sebegi crawl to another toilet that was too clogged to use. Quote, I was vomiting and had diarrhea. I just lay there in pain for hours. Sebegi was charged with resisting arrest and remaining present at the place of a riot. His bail was posted Thursday afternoon, but he was in too much pain to leave his cell. An ambulance was called and took Sebegi to Oakland's Highland Hospital some 18 hours after the beating took place. He will have company there. Highland is the same hospital where Iraq war veteran Scott Olson was taken after he suffered a fractured skull from a police tear gas canister in an Occupy Oakland protest October the 25th. We're going to talk with Guardian reporter Adam Gabbett, who's broke the Kayvon Sebegi story, and Dottie Guy with Iraq veterans against the war in a moment. In Oakland, a cleanup followed Wednesday's violence while police chief Howard Jordan tried defending his officers to booze at a city council meeting nearby. My officers showed great restraint in... Me, excuse me. Ex excuse me. If we're going to disagree, let us disagree respectful. And so if you, if you... If you want us to listen to you, then listen to the police chief. Before that meeting ended, Oakland City Council reportedly indicated they wanted to close the Occupy camp. They have yet to vote on any proposals to shut it down. Elsewhere in the Occupy movement, Occupy Tucson agreed to close its camp peacefully and move to another location after police told them they needed the first location for a series of weekend events. And here in New York, Occupy Wall Street protesters have a busy weekend planned. They'll be taking part in an end-to-end -end for 99% march with Harlem residents in a rally to urge depositors to move their accounts from too big to fail banks 
to smaller credit unions that serve communities first. Adam Gabbett is the correspondent for the British newspaper The Guardian who broke the story of the police attack on Iraq veteran Kayvon Sebegi. Um, Adam, first of all, terrific reporting. Thanks for joining us. You just got back from Oakland. When is Sebegi's surgery scheduled? What do doctors hope to do? Well, doctors hope to either insert a blood clot or a patch into his artery, he told me this morning, um, to stop internal bleeding from his ruptured spleen. Um, he described himself as having a stomach full of blood when we spoke, and he was awaiting surgery. He wasn't sure when it was going to happen. Could be tonight, could be tomorrow. He's, uh, he's a war, war veteran of both Iraq and Afghanistan. Did you detect his mood? What was he sort of, other than the physical pain, the emotional pain? He was pretty outraged. He, he couldn't really believe how police had been so violent towards him. He had a lot of anger towards police, although it must be said, when I spoke to him, he was clearly in a lot of pain. It was quite distressing to speak to him, actually, you could hear the fatigue in his voice. Um, as you mentioned in your intro, he's been 18 hours before he was taken to hospital. A lot of it led on a cell floor. And um, he was very angry with police. You know, he said, I, I can't believe they've done this. And that that's a, a feeling that Scott Olson and friends of his seem to have repeated, how a vet veteran can go to war, go to Iraq, go to Afghanistan, come back safely, thankfully, but then suffer these injuries at the hands of police here in the USA. You covered the general strike for The Guardian on Wednesday. Uh, you were in the area where the violence broke out on Wednesday night. Describe the scene. Describe how it happened. Protesters occupied a building, um, and a disused building, and um, that was taken... I'm not sure how they gained access, but they did, and that was taken peacefully, and people were gathered in there. And this was about 11 p.m. There was quite a carnival atmosphere on the street. Music was playing. Uh, Rihanna, at one point, seemed to be a particular favourite. And there was really quite a carnival mood, but then every so often, waves swept through the crowd, suggesting police were on their way. And at this, I walked down to Telegraph, um, walked east from this building, which was on 16th Street. And there, protesters had created a barrier to prevent anyone getting into the street. And um, I was hanging around there, and it became clear that police were massing, uh, at least 200 police officers, further up the street to the north. And at this, some protesters set fire to the barricade, creating quite sort of... Um, iconic scenes but also scary scenes and I think a lot of people got quite intimidated just by the fire's presence. That obviously meant police felt they had to act quicker, the fire was getting quite out of control. So they pushed down and people wouldn't move uh, back as quickly as they wanted and that was when they fired tear gas and what I believe to be flashbang grenades and I also spoke to one girl who had been hit by uh, rubber bullets. It sounds like um, Sebegi was hit with the police baton by perhaps several. Did you see any of that sort of activities with the police actually chasing people or people who were walking away from the scene? I couldn't see them chasing people. I did see people struck with batons. Um, the police massed in a line across Broadway, which was just to the north of where this was occurring. And they moved forward in a line using their batons like this in a kind of trudging motion and anyone who was in the way was struck by the baton. And some of the people didn't want to give ground. They were hit by batons. I saw one person fall to the ground and be carried away. Um, and then the police that would then get to a certain point, stop, then move forward again. Uh, it took them about two sort of movements like that to reclaim the area, the immediate area. Um, but from what I understand, Kayvan was injured further west from this. He was walking away from all the violence. He wasn't stood trying to prevent police from approaching. He said he was walking away uh, along, for, along 14th Street and he came into an isolated group of officers when he suffered his injuries. Which is so ironic because you were just pointing out a minute ago that um, off air that the Iraq and Afghan war veterans have been sort of at the front of the march in part because they're a little bit braver and, and perhaps reassuring others that this is going to be peaceful. That's correct. On the march to the port of Oakland, which was a very well organized uh, protest. There must have been thousands, up to 10,000 different estimates, uh, estimate different numbers. But we walked from uh, the plaza, the Frank H. Ogoa Plaza, where the Occupy Oakland protest is based, and uh, headed down to the port, which is, I mean, in total, it was about a three mile walk. And Iraq veterans were at the front of the march and 
they were very keen to keep the Iraq veterans in front of the sort of bulk of protesters. And uh, they were used as a sort of, like, you're, you're right, as a kind of calming presence. Mm. And also, these people have been to war, they're not intimidated, um, but also they won't overreact and, you know, throw things, stuff like that. What's been the mood since the reporting has gotten out that yet another Iraq war veteran is facing serious injuries at the hands of U.S. police? I think it's disbelief. I think the first time people were very emotional to hear of Scott Olson's injuries, especially when video came out which shown, mm. shew him, uh, shown him not being a provocateur in any way. Um, he was just stood calmly. And uh, since then, I've spoken to people from the Iraq Veterans Against the War movement who the feeling has been very much, I can't believe they've done it again. Mm. Um, Kayvan, from speaking to him, and uh, I believe him, he sounds a very honest guy, he sounded very hurt, but he said he was peaceful, he had his arms folded, he was trying to talk to officers when someone came forward and started hitting him with a baton. Um, it's just disbelief and also disgust that this can have happened again. Mm. Adam Gebet, uh, correspondent with the British Guardian, the newspaper, some incredible reporting and uh, thanks so much for coming on Countdown tonight and sharing with us, we appreciate it. Thank you very much. For more on this story, we're now joined by Dottie Guy with Iraq Veterans Against the War. Uh, Dottie, have you spoken with uh, Kayvon today, and, and what are you picking up about uh, the incident uh, from your perspective? Well, I did speak with him today, and he did sound like he was in a lot of pain. I really felt bad that he had to go through this, and there's a lot of disbelief that this happened again, and we were hoping that this, this event would happen peacefully. And, it devolved into what happened last on that night. What's your reaction to the reporting that we just got from uh, Adam Gabbett that in fact uh, this wasn't a case where essentially veterans were at the front of a protest even though they have been but this was a case where it sounds like he was walking away by himself and was a fair distance away from where the action was and that's where he got hit with batons. I feel that is absolutely just incredible that that would happen in the United States. We as you just mentioned before, we did walk in the front of the, of the Port of Oakland march, and we did try, we were there to defend our First Amendment right to peacefully assemble in the freedom of speech. And for a soldier to come back from war and have this happen to him, it's totally unbelievable. How did you learn about the, this case involving um, Kayvon, the, the latest one? One of my friends was, also, was arrested at the time, and he told me that he saw a vet that was on the floor in the, in the jail cell just in pain and just... He, he let us know, and we contacted the National Lawyers Guild to get more information about his whereabouts and his name. Do you see any uh, closer ties between the Occupy movement and uh, activist veterans groups going forward, perhaps by necessity because of how uh, dramatic this has become? Well, I think it's brought a lot more attention to it, and it shows that the veterans, we are part of the 99%. These wars that we're fighting, they've made a lot of people very rich, and a lot of us aren't getting the care and respect that we deserve. And with the vets that are coming back to the United States after the Iraq war ends, they're coming back to an economy where the unemployment rate is at astronomical level. And right now, there's, I think the unemployment rate is like 12.1% for veterans. And what are we going to do for these people when they come home and there's no jobs for them? It's very sad to hear that these people signed, their li signed away their life to defend their country and they're going to come home and not have not be able to do anything. Donnie, suppose there are police officers in the cities across the United States that are watching this interview now and uh, no doubt they will come face to face with Iraq and Afghan war veterans who are going to be at these marches. What's the one thing you want them to remember when they have these face to face meetings in the streets? I honestly just want them to know that we are there to be peaceful. We're there exercising our First Amendment right to be peaceful, to peacefully protest in our freedom of speech, and that we are there to make sure that the people who are at these protests don't have to, don't have to face violence for exercising what's in the Constitution. I honestly feel that I hope that they will use a, use a lot more tact in what they do and that they don't, we don't have incidents like this again. And the irony being that uh, there are a fair number of Iraq and Afghan war veterans who are members of these police departments who yes. have sort of doubled and, and, and whatnot. And, and so it just the, the irony and sort of the drama of that um, makes it perhaps even more sad, I suppose. Well, everyone has to work. I mean, if they feel that they should be working in the police department, I can't fault them. But I just really hope that they take this into consideration before they do any action that will cause harm to veterans or civilians. 
And then, Dottie, finally, uh, we, you had the opportunity to talk to police. What about to fellow veterans out there, even some who may not necessarily quite understand or agree with everything that the Occupy Wall Street movement is about, but may be so outraged over the fact that one of their brothers or sisters, a veteran, has been injured again. What's your message to fellow vets? I just want to let them know that they have a voice and they should be able to be heard. Right now, with all the vets that are coming back with PTSD, tyrannic brain injury, and the women who are coming back with sexual assault, we really need to know that they, they're not alone and they have a voice and they should, be, they should be able to voice it in the way that is peaceful and appropriate. Dottie Guy with Iraq Veterans Against the War. Dottie, uh, thanks so much for coming on tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Up next, the opportunity you have to occupy the financial system. Every day is bank transfer day, but this one is something special. And later, when the family you've named a bill after publicly condemns you and urges that your bill be defeated, perhaps it's time to back off. Not in Lansing, Michigan. What is wrong with them? This is Countdown. For many years, the Republican Party has had difficulty appealing to women voters, and yet again, we've seen the reasons why. A huge financial boost for Herman Cain, an outright mocking of his sexual harassment accusers. If you are not happy about those bailed out banks, you're going to love the action opportunity this weekend. Russian cosmonauts have just emerged from a Mars simulation 520 days in a dark windowless room in Moscow. We'll show you the video of when they finally emerged. And how would you feel if you set a world record in athletic competition and only four fans bothered to show up? And that's what she did. A lot. And time marches on. Another grassroots movement is gaining a groundswell of support among consumers, and this one is aimed at major banking institutions. In our fourth story in the countdown, Bank Transfer Day is an organization urging big bank customers to close their accounts this Saturday in favor of credit unions. Remember, remember! Remember, remember! The 5th of November! The 5th of November! The group has now gained the support of the Occupy movement, as well as thousands of fans on Facebook. Bank Transfer Day says its mission for Saturday is straightforward. If we shift our funds from the for-profit banking institutions in favor of not-for-profit credit unions before this date, we will send a clear message that conscious consumers won't support companies with unethical business practices. It's time to invest in local community growth. It appears the movement has already had quite an impact. According to the Credit Union National Association, credit unions have added more than 650,000 members and $4.5 billion in new deposits in the past month. The Los Angeles Times reports only 600,000 total joined credit unions in all of 2010. The group, conceived by Los Angeles gallery owner Kristen Christian was, and born on Facebook, was created out of anger against Bank of America's announced monthly $5 debit card fee. BOA has since put those plans on ice. The movement supporters say big banks are the reason we're in this financial mess to begin with. If you put your money in an investment bank, you have no idea where it's going to go. And every big bank has an investment banking branch that they use to turn your money into credit default swaps, toxic assets and things that brought down the, the mortgage market in the first place and completely crushed our economy. Joining us now, one of the organizers of Occupy LA, which has endorsed Bank Transfer Day, Chase Golding. And uh, Chase, a good of you to join us tonight. You're organizing a march tomorrow through LA's financial district to show support. Uh, what's the message of the march? The message of the march is uh, there's too much corporate power, and this is one tactic we're using as Occupy Los Angeles to use people power to put a check on that. Tell us about the relationship between the Occupy movement and Bank Transfer Day. Here in Los Angeles, um, I think of them as actually one and the same. I think we're aligned exactly along the same principles. Uh, we believe that banks have way too much power in this country, and it's hurting our society. Um, when banks got in trouble, Congress rushed to bail them out with taxpayer dollars. And now that our communities are suffering, uh, we can't get bailed out ourselves. We're being foreclosed on. Um, and so we want to move our money into institutions that will support the creation of jobs and do something with our money that actually helps our communities. I've heard a lot of people say that they would like to do this, they would like to support it, but it's, it's a pain to sort of go through all the steps of moving your checking account and your automatic bill payments from one bank to a credit union. Address those concerns. Is it really that difficult? 
Uh, it, it, it's somewhat difficult. I mean, I think we all are at different points. Uh, all occupiers that I talk to have different sort of financial situations. Um, but in my experience, when you open a credit union account, they're extremely helpful in working with you um, to make it as easy as possible. You definitely want to be careful that your direct deposit is switched over and your automatic bill pay. Uh, it's not something to rush, um, but it's an important statement to make as a conscious consumer. We saw, uh, and, I'm sorry, go ahead, finish. Oh, no. Uh, in my experience, credit unions are offering a level of service that we haven't seen from banks lately, uh, real individual attention and stuff like that. So if that's something you miss, you definitely uh, want to look at a credit union. Yesterday, we saw Occupy DC, Occupy uh, Senator Mitch McConnell's office. Today, of course, we're talking about the Bank Transfer Day movement. Has the Occupy movement uh, provided the framework or perhaps a, a viable forum for a lot of these different causes and issues? I think actually that's the most progress that, that we've made uh, as a movement. The biggest contribution we've made is to change that conversation nationally. I remember a month back, or what is it, two months back, uh, the conversation was all about cutting public services and reducing the deficit. And now we're actually talking about fixing the economy and rebuilding this country. And in my opinion, that's a, a pretty direct result of the occupations. As far as strategy, though, would all of these various movements be stronger if they joined forces in some way, and would that even be possible? I think people are always stronger when they come together. Um, this is, there's a lot of problems in this country, and uh, we need comprehensive solutions that are going to take all of us as Americans coming together and, and acting as one to take this country back and put it in a direction that, uh, that works for all of us again. And Chase, what do you see as the ideal next step? for the Occupy movement, not just in Los Angeles, but across the country? Um, man, it's really tough. There's a lot of problems that we have that we're facing as a movement. I think the ideal next step is to continue the discourse that we're having. Um, it's, it's moving, I wouldn't say slowly, I would say it's moving deliberately because we have uh, complex problems that we're facing and so we need comprehensive, holistic solutions. So. I would urge everyone to go to their local occupation, and I think within the first couple minutes, you're going to see uh, how positive it is, how wonderful people coming together in discourse can be, and uh, you're going to feel welcome, and you're going to feel powerful. Well, I've certainly found that uh, Occupy DC is perhaps the most interesting 24-hour political event that we have in that city today, and it's just a fascinating thing to watch. But uh, Chase Golding of Occupy Los Angeles. Chase, thanks so much for coming on the show tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. Coming up. The Republican anti-bullying bill in Michigan is so awfully written, perhaps by design, that it actually teaches bullies how they can get away with tormenting gay and lesbian classmates. I have a message for those Michigan Republicans. And Herman Cain, the Tea Party darling for president, has proclaimed his love for the Koch brothers? <laughs> Good grief. Coming up, a simulated mission to Mars comes to an end when the six volunteer astronauts return to Earth by exiting a warehouse in Moscow where they've been isolated for 520 days. But first, the sanity break. And it was on this day in 1879, cowboy philosopher and humorist Will Rogers was born on a ranch in Indian Territory. The son of a respected mixed-blood Cherokee couple, William Penn Adair Rogers, grew up riding and roping on the plains of Oklahoma. He joined Texas Jack's Wild West show at the age of 32 under the stage name Cherokee Kid. For all his rope skills, Rogers soon realized that audiences most enjoyed his impromptu jokes, witty remarks, and screenplays for The Lone Ranger. Time marches on. We begin as we always do with a prairie dog dancing in a tutu, something Poppy the Bichon in DC would never do do. How about that rhyme? Oh, oh sorry, we don't always begin with dancing dogs? Either way, move over Black Swan and make way for a cute brownish prairie dog. According to reports, the prairie dog actually trained with Barishnikov in the 80s and mimicked his love of popcorn. But let's be honest, those reports are probably not true. <laughs> in sports, let's go to the videotape. This young Japanese girl in front of all those fans is competing to be the fastest jump roper in the world. From the look on her face, it seems she really, really loves jumping rope. In the end, she completes 162 jumps in 30 seconds. So Japan wins the record for fastest jump roping, but the record for double Dutch is still held by the Dutch. <laughs> Friday, finally, it's Friday, and Maru the cat is so happy, can't stop trading high fives. The feline doesn't seem to be putting much effort into it, but hell, I'm impressed. 
I know what you're thinking. Schuster, are you a cat person? I'm thinking, hey, can Morrow do the other hand? Yes, he can. He goes left, he goes right. Next, he's going to work on that pat on the backside thing football players do on the sidelines. <laughs> Time marches on. <laughs> Up next, according to the polls and the fundraising, Herman Cain is having the best political week of his life. The establishment in the GOP is increasingly nervous. And later, would you ever want to spend a year and a half in a windowless room in Moscow with no light? Apparently some Russian cosmonauts volunteered. Countdown airs every weeknight here on Current TV at 8 p.m. You can also catch our primary replays at 11 p.m. Eastern and 11 p.m. Pacific. The attorney for Herman Cain's accuser spoke out today, but even as charges against Cain mount, contributions are pouring in and his poll numbers continue to march upward. In our third story tonight, what would have been a very bad week for Herman Cain has turned into a pretty good one, leaving Mitt Romney playing catch-up. First, the harassment victim's lawyer today called Cain's denials of the incidents, quote, inaccurate, and the lawyer pointed to the numerous complaints filed against Cain. There's an expression where there's smoke, there's fire. The fact that there are multiple complaints tells me that it's more likely than not that there was some sexual harassment activity by this man at that time. The revelations, though, do not seem to be dampening Republican enthusiasm for Kane or shifting it to anybody else. Seven in ten say the reports don't factor into their preference at all. The reports may have even strengthened Kane's appeal. Rush Limbaugh said today that Kane deserves credit for weathering the media storm. Politico, you failed. You attempted, along with others in the mainstream media, to take the guy out, and you failed. Kane continues to try and appeal to conservatives by making no apology for his far right leanings, like his close ties to billionaire conservative funders, the Koch brothers. Here's what Kane said today in front of Americans for Prosperity, the brothers' political front group. I am the Koch brothers' brother from another mother. Yes, I'm their brother from another mother. And proud of it. According to the latest polls, Kane is still neck and neck with Mitt Romney among Republican voters. As for the general election, Mitt Romney would do better than any other Republican candidate against President Obama. Romney is trying to rally the base by highlighting his conservative credentials. Today, he unveiled a plan to transform Medicare. Romney's top advisor even went out of the way to point out the Romney plan is very similar to the one proposed by Tea Party favorite Representative Paul Ryan. Romney is also proposing major slashes to spending, saying he would strip $1.6 billion from Amtrak's budget, take $600 million from the National Endowment for the Arts, the Endowment for the Humanities, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, reduce foreign aid by $100 million, and repeal the president's health care legislation. On social issues, Romney is also staking out far-right positions. His recent support for so-called life-at-conception legislation earned him this slam from Patrick Gaspar, the executive director of the Democratic National Committee, saying, in other words, a leading candidate for the GOP nomination for president is on the record in favor of a law that would classify literally all abortions and even many forms of birth control as murder. To be clear, this is the most radical position any of the Republican candidates have taken on this issue. Joining us now, Steve Kornacki, news editor for Salon. And Steve, uh, thanks for being here. Sure. First of all, uh, Herman Cain, the Teflon candidate, nothing sticks to him. What is going on? You know, it, it surprised me, obviously, because, you know, uh, Sunday night when this story broke, I think everybody thought, well, that's it. The bubble's going to burst now, and we're going to see who comes up next to be the main alternative to Romney. But I think two things have sort of happened this week. One is that for all the talk of the scandal, for all the terrible handling that Kane has done of this, there haven't been any really damning revelations. We just know he was accused of sexual harassment. There were settlements. We don't really know exactly what it was he's accused of doing. So I think that's created wiggle room for these guys like Limbaugh and Sean Hannity to go out there. And they just love this. They love, you know, oh, we're going to you know, rally around the black conservative who's being persecuted by the liberal media. I mean, it's a total alternate reality version of events, but it's one that I think that has powerful emotional resonance with the average Republican voter. So in the absence of damning details, mm -hmm. I think it's a very tempting narrative for them to kind of believe in. Tempting in the primaries, but in a general election, that seems like that could be 
death as you try to reach independence and centrist. That's the ultimate irony to me in watching Rush Limbaugh and listening to Sean Hannity say all these things this week. If they really believe it, and if what they're saying actually has the effect of vaulting Herman Cain to the nomination, they are actually doing a huge favor for Democrats. The whole idea that Democrats would orchestrate an attack on Herman Cain right now is nuts because the, the one thing that I think we know would save Barack Obama in 2012 is if the Republicans nominate Herman Cain. It'd be the best thing that could happen to them. Does Cain have staying power in the Republican primaries? I mean, no organization, not a lot of money, no state offices. I mean, it's, it's remarkable, and yet there he is skyrocketing in the polls. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I still doubt it. I still think he's the kind of candidate who maybe, you know, if there's no more revelations on this thing, maybe he can win Iowa. Maybe he can come close in Iowa, something like that. I just have the feeling, for all the reasons you cited, for just the total obviousness to guys not like Hannity and not like Limbaugh, but other Republicans, the total obviousness of what a disaster he'd be as a general election candidate, I think in the end, some way, somehow, they get to Romney. But boy, it, Romney can't feel good that it's been this hard. As far as Mitt Romney, we, we saw the, you know, the efforts today to try to line him up with Paul Ryan as far as changing Medicare. Will that work for Mitt Romney with Republicans? Will they suddenly believe, oh, Mitt Romney's one of us? Well, I, it's funny. You look at that, that list of spending cuts he's proposing. I mean, that's the hit list for conservatives. You know, they like to complain there's way too much spending, government's too big, you ask them what they want to cut. Those are the sorts of things. There are emotional hot buttons like the NEA and public broadcasting that basically add up to nothing. So that's what Romney put out today. But it has a lot of, you know, I think, resonance with the average conservative. But the problem for Romney, when you start getting into the Medicare stuff, you know, the Paul Ryan plan, that's a politically toxic plan. That was established, I think, earlier this year when you had that special election in the Republican district in New York. The Paul Ryan plan was the big issue. The Democrat won in a, in a seat the Democrats hadn't won in forever. So if Romney has to embrace that stuff to get the Republican nomination, that's the kind of thing that either he sticks to it in the fall and it hurts him because it's an extreme position, or he does what Romney always does and he gets to the fall and he backs away from it and it reinforces the flip-flopper narrative. So Romney's put himself in a tough position either way there. Is the flip-flop narrative sticking with Romney, though, among Republicans? I mean, we hear Democrats making it a lot. Um, there was the president saying, hey, we pattern our health care after Mitt Romney. And Perry and Bachman and others have tried to sort of make the charge. Is that working? Well, it, it, in a way it is because it's, it, it's so well known and well established that he's, he used to be the Massachusetts moderate and he's changed. But I think part of the story is that Perry and Bachman and all these others are spectacularly bad at making that case. <laughs> and so it, it's been sitting there and they've been totally unable in debate after debate to formulate a simple potent, coherent attack on Mitt Romney that says, hey, conservatives, you can't trust this guy. So it, it's sort of, it's, it's the low-hanging fruit, and these guys are so short, and they can't jump, they, they can't catch it. And then finally, what are you picking up from the Romney campaign about Herman Cain? Do they continue to sort of sit back and wait for him to implode, or do they feel at a certain point, no, they have to be more aggressive? And I, 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 my sense of the Romney campaign is, if there's going to be one sort of designated conservative alternative to Romney in the primaries, they're happier with it being Cain than Perry for the simple fact that you know, he's getting money this week. Kane still doesn't have Perry money, doesn't have any endorsements, doesn't have any political organization. And I think there's more doubt among Republican leaders about Kane's ability to win in the fall than Perry's, although there's plenty of doubt about Perry, too. So I think they'd, all things being equal, they'd rather have Kane be that guy because they think he's a softer, you know, a softer opponent. Steve Kornacki, news editor for Salon. Steve, always a pleasure talking politics and anything else with you. And thanks for coming on the sure, show. Sure, happy to do it. Just ahead, the anti-bullying legislation written by Republicans in Lansing, Michigan, is so sloppy and embarrassing, the family it was named after is urging the bill's defeat. Michigan Republicans, are you listening? Lansing, Michigan is known for many things. The Michigan State University Spartans and the state capitol, to name a few. Now, Lansing is also home to arguably the worst written legislation in the country. It will do exactly the opposite of what its authors say they intend. And later, Russian cosmonauts actually intended to spend 17 months in a room with no windows or light. They emerged today. We will show you the results. If you think members of Congress do some pretty stupid things, we now have proof that federal lawmakers are Einsteins compared to the Republicans in the state Senate in Michigan. In our second story in the countdown, yes, the city of Lansing is now home to a group of Republican lawmakers who wrote a law so badly that even the family it was named after reacted with disgust. This might actually be funny if it wasn't such a serious issue. The issue is school bullying. Study after study and case after case has demonstrated that bullies sometimes drive teenage victims to suicide. 
Most states are fighting back with laws to protect the victims. Michigan Republicans just moved a bill forward with language to protect the bullies. Seriously, the Michigan Senate, led by Republicans, added language this week to their self-described anti-bullying law with a sentence that says, this section does not prohibit a statement of sincerely held religious belief or moral conviction of a school employee, school volunteer, pupil, or a pupil's parent or guardian. In other words, you apparently can torment a classmate if you believe the Bible tells you so. That means misguided kids who are taught that being gay is an abomination, well, they are now free to torment their gay and lesbian classmates anytime, anywhere. Here's the reaction from the leader of Michigan Senate Democrats. There are at least 10 Michigan children in the past decade whose deaths are directly attributable to bullying. You're explicitly outlining how to get away with bullying. This bill is called Matt's Law, after Matt Epling, a 14-year-old boy who killed himself in 2002 after anti-gay classmates poured syrup and crushed eggs on his head. And the saddest and sickest irony of this whole thing is that it's called Matt's Safe School Law. And after the way that you've gutted it, it wouldn't have done a damn thing to save Matt. This is worse than doing nothing. It's a Republican license to bully. Kevin Epling, Matt's father, he called the bill government-sanctioned bigotry. Bullying is destroying communities. It is destroying lives. Their lives cut short because someone else thought it would be fun to intimidate, humiliate, and harass them. Please don't hide it away internally. Let someone know what you're going through. And Democratic Senator Glenn Anderson read more from a statement by Matt's father. To give people a pass because their verbal or physical abuse or assault, rather, is sanctioned by religion is mind-boggling. I am ashamed this, that this could be Michigan's bill on anti-bullying when it in fact is a bullying is okay in Michigan law. Shame on our elected officials. Republicans say the intent of the legislation is not to give bullies a legal roadmap, but rather to get each district to write an anti-bullying policy in the next six months. Well, Michigan Senate Republicans, you've picked one hell of a way to inspire the school districts to act. I appreciate that your intention, or the intention of most of you, may not have been to enable wingnut kids to torment their gay and lesbian classmates. But the fact is, that's exactly what this legislation would do. It would enable the most despicable behavior imaginable. And it is the worst written bill I've ever seen in 20 years of covering both state and federal politics. The worst. Thankfully, the Republican-led House in Michigan doesn't support the language, and the governor has questions, too. So Michigan shouldn't have to rely on the common sense of House Republicans and the Republican governor to see this thing die. This bill is an embarrassment to anybody with half a brain in the great state of Michigan. At best, Senate Republicans there have lost their cognitive thinking skills. At worst, they are evil, homophobic, bullying enablers. Either way, this is outrageous. The legislation is insulting and offensive, and it must be stopped. Outer space still remains the last frontier. The next logical step in space exploration is a trip to our sister planet, Mars. In our number one story, six men have just completed what can only be described as an extremely small step for mankind after completing a 17-month mock mission to Mars. Mock being the key word. Six men arrived home today after spending 520 days on a simulated trip to Mars. Oh. Sorry, that was footage from the movie Total Recall. Here's the actual footage of the brave man emerging from what appears to be a shack. The $15 million Mars 500 mission was focused on the psychological effects of being in a confined space for an extended period of time. The men were fed rations, rarely showered, and were under constant surveillance to monitor their health. The mission carried out by the European Space Agency and Russia's Institute of Biomedical Problems seems to have been a success as all six men emerged healthy. They will undergo evaluations over the next few days to confirm their health. This is a major advancement for the program after a similar experiment failed in 2000 after two of the participants got in a fist fight. Still, space officials say technologically they are still decades away from protecting astronauts from cosmic radiation, landing them 35 million miles away, and then bringing them home. Basically, 
everything that would be required in actually sending people to Mars. <laughs> Here to explain all of this in terms I can understand is Chief Astronomer of the Franklin Institute and Countdown Contributor Derek Pence. Derek, thanks as always for your time tonight. Does this prove that humans are ready to go to Mars? <laughs> I really don't think so, Dave. I think what it does, though, is it at least gives us a window into figuring out what sorts of things we really have to pay attention to when we consider sending people on such a long trip. This was only six people. Imagine a, uh, a real voyage with maybe 12 people, and they have to travel together for a year and a half or two years all the way out to Mars, some 45 to 50 million miles away. It's uh, not an easy prospect. They still had gravity. <laughs> they didn't have to take off or land. There are no new atmospheres. What, though, could they possibly learn about a trip to Mars by essentially being locked in a room together for 17 months? Well, the psychological aspect really is very important when you think about it. You know, here you have a group of people that have been thrown together for this particular mission. And indeed, maybe they have worked together and trained together for a long time. But when you put them under the stresses that really would be involved in a Mars trip, I think it can really change people. And we have to watch out for exactly what kinds of changes might take place. So in this particular instance, one of the things that's missing, I think, is the stress of being on a journey that could turn out to be a one-way trip in many ways, depending how things shake out. So I think that would add a tremendous amount to interactions between people, how people react to this, all those sorts of things that can't really have any resolution in a sense once you get out on a trip like this. So it's better to try to figure it out ahead of time. We have the space station though, so why not actually try this in, in actual space? Part of the reason why we aren't doing this just yet in actual space is because it would be very expensive to do this. We'd essentially have to dedicate International Space Station to at least six months of, of time just for this alone. And then, of course, there's the risk involved. You know, International Space Station is 220 miles above the Earth, traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. So when you put those factors together, then it sort of uh, begs the question, do we really want to do this? So there needs to be a commitment by all the partners or players who might be involved in a trip like this to actually put up the cash and put up the dedication to seeing an experiment like that through. A very important one that should be done at some time. Moving on to other space stories, uh, I keep reading if there's an asteroid coming to destroy all of us next week. Are Bruce Willis and his ragtag group of oil drillers ready to go save the world? I think they need to get ready. Well, we don't have any real impending danger just yet. Although, next Tuesday evening, there will be an asteroid. It's asteroid 2005YU55, I believe it is, that is going to pass within about 200,000 miles of Earth. Now, that's even closer than the orbit of the Moon, which is 238,000 miles. This object, though, is only 400 meters in width, and that's about 1,200 feet and it will pass above the orbital plane of the Earth. So even though it's relatively close, closer than anything else we've seen in like the last 30 years or so, it's not large enough to do any damage to us. No need for us to worry, uh, but uh, maybe possible for some people to actually see it in the evening sky. Would you need a telescope to be able to see it? You need a very big telescope to see it because the object, even though it's 400 meters, David, it's still small, it's still quite dark, dim even, if you will, and because it's moving at a pretty good rate of speed, it might be difficult to pick it up, but it's still observable by uh, professional astronomers using radar telescopes and other instruments. Another story out today about uh, NASA trying to create a laser that acts as a tractor beam. Since we're no longer sending people into space, why do we need a tractor beam? And, you know, the actual idea of this is, is not really the Star Trek idea of grabbing spacecraft and pulling them in, but a, a, a group of scientists at NASA have figured out that there are certain kinds of physical properties that laser beams have that if you uh, cross the beams in just the right way, you can actually make very small particles move along the beams. So it's somewhat similar to, you know, the scene that we saw in Ghostbusters where they cross the beams of the guns and they pull the spirits in. Well, it's kind of like that, except they're not not pulling spirits, they're just pulling very small particles. Could be applicable when trying to get particles from distant planets uh, to be drawn up from the surface without sending people down. And real quickly, will we ever reach a point where we've reached the smallest particle? I don't think we'll get to that smallest particle. There's so much out there. You know, we're trying right now to figure out how to use a laser beam to identify these really tiny elementary particles. But I think there's a whole lot more in that zoo of the very, very small that we have yet to discover. Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer of the Franklin Institute. Derek, thanks as always. We appreciate it. My pleasure, David. Thank you. And that is it for this edition of Countdown. I'm David Schuster in for Keith Olbermann. On behalf of all of us at Current TV, thanks for watching, everybody. Have a great weekend.